look in the Word of God, amen, you look in the book of Revelation and other places, especially in the book of Revelation, you see that the angels maintain their strength and their character by worshiping the Lord. Worship created, inspired by our Father. Not that God has a low self-esteem or that he needs his creation to uplift uh, who he is. You, you really, you know, like we see men on the earth who, who like to be exalted and who, and uh, um, I mean, you get a picture of this in these really silly movies that they make and, and beings that like to be glorified by man. But that's not the picture of our Father. Amen. Our Father existed when he was all by himself and our Father understood who he was and, and, and the greatness of who he was when he was all by himself. So one thing, amen, before I say anything else, if you can grasp hold of and understand the dynamics of worship designed by our Father for us, it is an exchange. It's an, it is an exchange that when we bless our Creator, amen, a heavenly substance that flows from us goes to Him. Amen. And just like you greet someone or you kiss someone, amen, in an exchange or greeting, worship is the highest greeting So this exchange takes place. And the more revelation, the more understanding you have of this king, the more yielded you are to this king, the more the transfer of this power of who he is takes place. So consequently, because of the angels and how they are engaged, your, 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 your guardian angels were not necessarily made for war, but they will fight. Amen. Amen. One thing that they carry with them, just as the chauffeur they carry by their side, when the chauffeur is blown, amen, by Gabriel, then your angel will blow the chauffeur as well. And if you are in relationship with the Lord, you will hear the last trump, because they will blow it right in your ear. So as they carry the chauffeur with them, another thing that they carry him is the sword of the Lord. And the sword is wielded, it is energized, probably a better way of saying, by the power and light that flows through them. So one thing, amen, that keeps this sword energized is what? Their worship to God. Amen. Their worship to God. In my backyard where I live, I have a angel hospital. And back there, there are angels that come because of the open heaven. They come from all over the United States and even from some other countries in their travel to do what? Because they there, as they gather there, they worship and worship and worship and worship because when angels are in fight, and even some are even captive, some are even taken captive for a while. And their spirit energy is drained, amen, when they are in war just like when they capture or fight darkness. They drain darkness of their energy. Darkness is their energy. Darkness is their strength. And they are weakened. Well, in the same way with the angels of the Lord. So if angels who are greater in power and might than we are must engage with our Father, Amen. In an exchange called worship and giving of thanks, then what do you think about us? Amen. Listen, just like the food you eat, and within the food you eat, there lie certain nutrients that your body needs. Worship and praise is one of the nutrients that your spirit man must engage in. Must. Amen. It is very, very, very difficult to stand in faith, to declare faith, to walk by faith, 
amen, if your faith is not energized, amen, by worship and thanksgiving. Amen? So, consequently, when Isaiah, turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 and look at verse 1. You know the story. The Bible said, when the, the year King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord. And you know that King Uzziah was a friend of Isaiah, Isaiah being a prophet of God. The calling was on him, amen, but not to the degree until after his friend died. After his friend died, amen, something happened to him. Something happened to him. Uh, just like any time of sorrow, it causes you to go inward, right? Sorrow and difficulty brings what? Reflection, right? To the human being, right? Reflection. Whether you're reflecting on the sorrow or something that has happened to you, or you reflect on your strength, amen, who is the God on the inside of you? There is reflection. So we find Isaiah reflecting in verses 1 through 8, and the Bible said that he saw the Lord. So in his reflecting, in his meditating, in his going inward, his spiritual eyes were open, and he saw the Lord. He saw the Lord. He saw right into heaven. Amen. Whether he was transported into heaven, it's a possibility. The Bible doesn't clarify it, but neither, neither, neither to say he, will, he saw into heaven. He saw the glory of the Lord. He saw the, the, the fire of his presence. Amen. He saw, amen, the, 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 the garment, amen, that the Bible describes as his train, amen, fill the temple. So with the description that Isaac gives, there is then must be a ascension of the Lord to his walk as a king walking to his throne. Amen. And no doubt, just like a king, he was walking under a canopy. Amen. That the angels hold up. And so he sees him. Now, there's an interesting part about this, though. When he sees him in a certain way, he sees himself. Amen. Now, understand this now, that I don't know at this particular time, how much of the word of God of the of the major prophets the books that Moses wrote how much they were assimilated you know amongst Israel we know that they were kept in the temple the scrolls amen that Moses wrote but as far as the other books of the Bible we don't know um, when they were written well of course as Isaiah was experiencing this we know that book was a my point is that Isaiah had an encounter with the Lord face to face. Our first encounter with the Lord comes through what? The Word, the Scripture, the Scripture. And as we meditate on the Word, then it brings, according to Proverbs, life to us. Life, understanding. So when Isaiah saw the Lord, looking upon him, just as we see him through his word, revelation came. But not only revelation came, insight to his condition. Amen? That's why it's so important for you to look at the word of God and meditate the word of God. Because you can't see yourself the way heaven sees you unless you behold the scriptures. Amen? Or unless what happened to you, what happened to Isaiah, happened Lord, unveil your face and you see him face to face. Well, seeing him face to face is no different in looking in the scriptures because you will only see, first of all, what he allows you to see of himself. And in seeing, it's only based upon the light that is already on the inside of you. Amen. The Lord can appear right now on this platform. Each one of you see him, but each one of you will see something different. 
based upon your need and your desire, based upon, amen, what he wants to reveal to you beyond the light that is in you, and based upon the light that is in each one of you, that's how you will see it. Amen? But the most important thing about the scripture, amen, is to show us what is needed in our lives show us what is needed. So God has a way then of unveiling truth, amen, and when that truth, now watch this, when God unveils truth, there is a dynamic that takes place. There is something that it is, that is exposed in you that will fight against this truth at the same time give the enemy access and God knows it amen God is, just, God is not just interested in giving us information because information is no good to us it's revelation revelation is beneficial to us but is also dangerous to us huh amen that's why growth may, growth is will only take place when you're really serious about moving on with the Lord. Because if you're not really serious in moving on with the, with the Lord, you're, 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 you're backing a fight upon yourself that you're not ready to fight. Amen. And then in that fight, you will lose some of what you have. Right? In a fight in the natural, you will either gain or you lose. It's no different spiritually. So God will purposely, God will purposely keep you out of the realm of revelation. Keep you out of it. If you are not moving on with him, and secondly, if you are not doing what has already been revealed to you. Because the Bible says, he that had shall more be given. And he that had not shall be taken even that which he has. Amen? So again, there is a dynamic. If you're not moving forward, if you're not moving forward, eventually you're going to get to the place where you're going to lose what you have. Because you're going to give the enemy such an access, amen, in, 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 in temptation and tribulation that he's going to bring you down. But if you're moving forward in the Lord, you are doer of the word, amen, then the word dictates that you will, you will begin to flow in revelation. And in flowing in revelation, amen, as you behold him in the word or as you behold him in prayer, amen, then you will automatically, immediately bring a fight to yourself. Immediately. Luke 6 says, Satan cometh immediately to take revelation that's sown. The word sown is revelation. You see it. So he comes to take it before you do what? Before you begin to do it. Amen? Before it begin to grow in your life, become a part of who you are. So this dynamic is going on. So now, consequently, now you can see why we see very little growth in the church. Brother, sister, coming to church don't did no growth, does not did no growth. Reading the Bible does not did, did no growth. Not leaving Jesus or backsliding does not did no growth. Amen. A doer, being a doer of the word, denotes growth. So now, if, since Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith then, then Jesus plays a major part in our progression and growth. He plays a major part in how fast we grow. He plays a major part. We set the pace. Our hunger sets the pace. 
he said, if you hunger and thirst, you what? You'll be filled. So he does the feeling. But we set the pace. So then you got to be involved in doing what? Maintaining your hunger. And one of the things that maintain your hunger is engaging and giving thanks to the Lord. It, it wets your spiritual taste buds for the goodness of God and the joy of God. When you engage in true worship, your desire for him rises. Amen. Your desire for him calls out to him. It causes you to do what? Discipline yourself to do what is necessary to run after him. That's the power of thanksgiving and worship when you engage in it. Hallelujah. Amen. So, when Isaiah tried to worship with the angel, he discovered two things. He realized, first of all, he was undone. And his sins had separated him. Had separated him. So, as Holy Spirit always does, Holy Spirit will always lead you in the way that you should go. So, there came from Isaiah this compelling cry. I'm undone. I'm not where I should be. His surroundings had so affected him and separated him from God, he did not realize it. Hence, that's why it is so dangerous to being with the wrong crowd or being with the wrong group. And that's even church group. Amen. Because if you're not a go-getter, one that does not settle for the norm, then you will fall to the level of the norm. Amen. Begin to compromise just as all the norm that is around you and you will not even know amen, that you are not rising above everything that is around you. You understand what I'm saying? You won't even, you won't even realize it because unless someone breaks out and does something that is not normal. <laughs> if, unless God lifts, and that is usually God's way. But at that point, there is, there is what has happened, you know, uh, pretty much backsliding has taken place. You can backslide and not leave Jesus. How I many you know that? Not lay down your salvation, what I mean. And so usually when whether we as individuals or a group or denomination or whatever you want to call it, slide back from the Lord, then the Lord usually falls upon what? A man or a woman in the form of revival to lift them up and to do what? Revive them. Revive them. We should constantly be being revived. Constantly. Amen? So here is Isaiah. He's trapped by his surroundings. Amen. No one is calling out to God. No one is crying out to God. Amen. No one, amen, is involved, you know, in bringing God's presence to the earth. Amen. So he does realize that he has fallen very far away from God. Until something happens. Then he realizes he's undone. He realized his sins had separated him. He tried to utter words of praise, and he realized because of his sins, his words were really, were really, were not words of praise. But, and this is something that happens all the time. And I submit to you, if you ask God to do it, he will. In my prayer, I told you this past Wednesday, in my prayer time, one of the things that I do all the time, constantly, is prayer, prayer, repentance. Another thing that I do all the time, constantly, I ask the Lord to allow his angels to take coals of fire and place it upon my lips and burn a quality of sin 
from me. Sometimes I feel the cold, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I have to step out by faith. But this is something that I do all the time. Amen. We see, we see a, a dynamic, the Holy Spirit reveals a dynamic that takes place in Isaiah's life. But my point is, it's not something that's, that still does not happen. If you desire to happen, it will. If you ask the Lord, he will. It's part of what? The prayer of repentance. Amen? Just like, guess what? Just like you wake up in the morning or at night, whenever you shower, take a bath. Amen? And you can clean yourself, clean yourself. You can take a brush, amen, a scouring pad or whatever you use. Amen. To scrub yourself. Amen. I mean, until you, your skins are thin. But guess what? When you go outside and you come back in, you're going to pick up dirt whether you want to or not. Right? You're going you're gonna to start smelling whether you want to or not. Why? Because you came from the dirt. And so you easily attract dirt. But the same thing spiritually. Just by virtue of living in this world, Amen. The filth of the world starts trying to cling to us. Well, how? Through our senses. Through our five physical senses. Important of what you put your eyes before your eyes. It's important of what goes into your ear. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> it is important of the words that comes out of your mouth. It is important uh, concerning what you touch. It is important what you do with your body because what you do with your body affects your mind. You know what I'm saying, dear? What you do with your body affects your mind. You can do certain things from a sexual standpoint with your body and it'll start affecting your mind. Your mind will start to try to create pictures in, in retrospect to what? what you're doing to your body. So it's very, very important. So Isaiah recognized because of revelation that came. So he cried out to God. He made a confession. He desired to be free. He desired to, to be obedient to the Lord. So an angel came and took a coal of fire off the altar and placed it upon his lips. So when it happened, he experienced atonement and forgiveness of sin. Amen? But, what does it say to you and I today? Isaiah's experience became worship. Became worship. When it is, when, when you know that there's sin in your life, when you know that you've come short, and you ask the Lord uh, to forgive you, and you know that you're forgiven, then what comes automatically rolling from your heart? Worship. Thanksgiving, right? Thanking God for his blood. You are revitalizing the covenant. It is putting you in remembrance of what the cause, cross brought you. Amen. Your spirit man appreciates it more than your head does. And if you learn to bring the three into alignment, your spirit will propel you towards spiritual things automatically. Automatically. So, that's why it's so important. That's why it's so important even before you talk to God, even before you have a conversation with God, amen, the protocol is to do what? Appreciate him. Thank him. As you enter into his gate with thanksgiving, then there is a showering of, a washing of the presence of God over you, amen, to enable you to do what? Come into his presence. And as the showering takes place, as you give thanks, as you give thanks, as you give thanks, as you give thanks, as you worship, as you worship, 
believe me, there is something that is taking place. There is a washing, amen, that's coming from the presence of the Lord that is taking place again and again and again. It's washing over you, over you, over you, over you. And every time it does, now it's not growing you up spiritually, but what is it doing? It's cleansing you. It's cleansing you of doubt and unbelief. It's cleansing you of stuff that has clung to you throughout the week or the previous night uh, when the last time you engaged with the Lord. It is cleansing you. And then when it does, it reaches a certain level. Now you are, to, now you are to able to do what? You are able to enter into his presence. Thanksgiving and praise is like soap and water. It is. It's like soap and water. It ushers you into the presence of the Lord. Whereby what? Now, your hearing is more clear. Your seeing is more clear. Your, your praise and thanksgiving is more spirit-driven than flesh-driven. Do you hear me? So, Isaiah became, he became, he began to worship when he experienced forgiveness of sin. Then he could hear God. He could receive his call. So the conclusion is, since the beginning of worship is the forgiveness of sin, only born again Christians can truly worship. Truly worship. Now, all of creation can give thanks and should but only born again Christians can worship in spirit and in truth amen there is an interaction that causes his presence to flow through you there is a dynamic that takes place that your spirit can handle amen that a person is not born again cannot. Amen? So, so if confession then, if confession and repentance is the beginning of worship, then how often should we repent, as we said before? For you to continue to experience true worship, you must have a daily time of confession and repentance. The Lord taught this in his prayer. When in the Lord's Prayer, he began the expression, Hallowed be thy name. In the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be thy name. If you take the Lord's Prayer and divide in the segment, you see several principles that take place. The first one is worship. All right? The first one is worship. So, Jesus is not just giving them words on how to pray. He's teaching principles as well, okay? So hallowed be thy name. This is a statement recognizing that his name is sacred and sanctified. Sacred and sanctified. It's, it's not an expression of worship. It's recognizing what his name is. The expression of worship comes at the end. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Okay? However, there is an expression in this prayer that lets you know this is a guideline for your daily prayer. And that's what Jesus was actually giving. Now, there's nothing wrong. And from there, you have Christians, especially, you know, when you when you were learning how to pray, then, you know, you learn how to pray the Lord's Prayer. When in actuality, he wasn't giving you that so you can pray the Lord's Prayer. Well, you can. But there are principles within the Lord's Prayer, amen, that you should understand. And most of the church does not. So, he gives us this day, he, he gives us this day our daily bread, Jesus goes on to say. So what do I mean by this term? Daily bread is based on the Old Testament teaching of what? Manna. When Israel was instructed to collect only what they needed for that day. 
Notice in the prayer, it doesn't say, give me this week my daily prayer, does it? Give me this day my daily prayer. See, in dealing with God, as I told you before, God will never ever take the element of faith out of the equation. And he didn't do it with Israel. He told them to only get what they needed for that day. They had to walk by faith with it. They had to believe that the next day there would be more. But just like most people, what did they do? Oh, we got to get something for tomorrow. We got to get when God told them, no, just for that day. And so what happened? The next day, it stink, it rotten. But brother, sister, let me ask you a question. You think God has changed? Huh? No, he hasn't. The Bible said, take no thought for what? Tomorrow. Don't worry about it. Today you should be concerned about it. Today you believe that God will give you what you need. Amen. So when you greet him in the morning, amen, and when you pray and you enter into his presence, amen, then out of your mouth, after you have went through praise and thanksgiving and you've watched yourself spiritually, then out of your mouth, I mean, part of the dynamics of the Lord's prayer should be, Lord, I need today my daily bread. Now, in your saying that, what do you understand? Do you mean just what you eat? Your, your, your understanding of that should go beyond just your physical substance. Amen? Part of that daily bread, amen, is revelation. Lord, I need to see you in a different light. I need to see you today in a different way. Brother, and sister, each day, each day, God wants to reveal a portion of himself to you. And if you go throughout the day and don't receive that, then you are lacking. You are lacking. It's not God's fault. It's our failure to do what? It's our failure to enter in. Notice you have to enter in. Even if you are still and you're waiting on the Lord, in your waiting, you still have to enter in. Amen? And that becomes more important to you based upon your spiritual growth. Because there is times that God will hide himself. He will hide his presence. He will hide the, the, the feeling, amen, the, 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 uh, the, the electricity or whatever you want to describe what you feel when God comes. He will even hide that at times to get you to do what? Pursue him. He will never ever take away the element of faith. You live in your life, your Christian walk based on feelings. You're going to be in trouble. Amen. You're going to be in trouble. The scripture says, destruction and in famine I will laugh. Well, laughter, again, is a part of what? The, a dynamic of worship and giving thanks. It's, a, it's part of the dynamic of washing, again, that takes place as you enter into his presence. Amen? I remember seven, many, many years ago when I was working down in Washington State and we were working in a, a chip plant it was a uh, plant that was built by Sony, one of the computer places. And this place was cleaner than a hospital. Before we went inside, they had revolving doors. First we had, we looked just like doctors, first of all, when we went in. We had gloves on, boot the booties and the, and the, and the white stuff, and uh, just covered all over. And then when we went into the door, this burst of air hit us as we went through the door and then we went inside this, this building that they were building. And they were building, uh, in there they were making computer chips. So there could not be any, any, I mean not even the smallest of length, trash, nothing, because this is a small piece of electronics that they're making for computers. And so, and why did I bring it up? Because I thought about when we went through the door, this, this burst of air 
would just come over us. And remind me, when we enter into his gates with thanksgiving, then this presence comes from the Lord that floods over you and washes you and cleanses you. What is the qualification? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Now, if you go before the Lord and you're sorrowful, your heart is breaking, and you're hurting, that's all well and good, but brother, sister, guess what? For you to, before you leave there, for you to be sustained and lifted up and strengthened, you're going to have to move to Thanksgiving. Or you're going to come out of there the same way you went in. Amen. He that cometh to God must first believe that what? He is. And he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. Amen. That's part of the path of thanksgiving that you go in. And God will reward you. God will again begin to do what? Console you. Bring into your spirit whatever is needed. Bring forth revelation to you, encouragement to you something spiritually tangible from heaven that you cannot physically perceive, but your spirit man can reach out and take it and draw it into yourself. This dynamic is taking place. And you have to understand what is going on in the spirit realm. Or you'll be bound by your feelings, amen, and if you don't feel something, you know, or hear something, you won't believe that something has taken place. God is, doesn't have a physical body. God is a spirit. Angels are spirit. And when they bring something from heaven, it is a spiritual substance. It is a heavenly materiality. And you can't reach out with it and take it with your physical hand or with your mind for that matter, you must take it with your spirit. And you pull it into yourself. And it's so, the question is, it is not that heaven didn't do his part. You didn't do yours. You, you already know what I'm saying to me? So, so when Israel was instructed then to collect only what they needed for the day, they had to believe God, my point is, for the next day. This means that Christ intended for the meaning of this prayer to be prayed then every day, didn't he? The meaning of it I'm talking about. Not necessarily the prayer itself, but the meaning of it. Lord, I need something from you every day. Now, Jesus already told us, Paul already told us, we know not what to pray for as we are, right? Right? So, thank God for tongues. Your spirit man knows exactly what it means. How does it know? Because your spirit man will search the spirit of God. And Holy Spirit will put in your spirit man what you need. And your spirit will pray in tongues exactly what you need. And heaven will bring it to you in time. Amen. Sometimes it is depositing you right then and there. Guess what? But you don't need it now. There's something that you must go through or endure before it is released on the inside of you. Answered prayers sometimes come into us like a time capsule. Something must happen. You must reach a certain threshold. Certain revelation must hit you before it is released on the inside of you. Amen. Example. Someone may, ask, someone may ask you, do you know what you need to do in the case of this or that? Let's say for your own life, not somebody else's life. Do you know what you need to do? In the natural, you may not know. I don't know what to do. But guess what? That should not be your response. Your response should be the one on the inside of you knows. And because he knows, I will know. Amen. You say, well, what's the big difference? It is a big difference. Amen. Because again, you got a pipeline from heaven, revelation, 
knowing. He lives on the inside of you. Amen. And if you don't understand, amen, that faith is the key that unlocks heaven's door to bring everything that you need, then part of that is your tongue, your conversation must be one of faith. Must be one of faith. You may not know now, but I will know. Amen? You know when you speak in doubt and unbelief. But doubt and unbelief won't open the knowledge of God. Hallelujah. So, the words forgive us of our debts. As we forgive our debtors. Are an expression of confession and repentance of sin. Now notice the order. The statement, confession and repentance is before worship. Now most of the people here that give us up our debt, we give our debt to they think of money. That's not what he's talking about. That's not what he's talking about. If someone does something to you and you don't forgive them, then you owe them a debt. You are indebted to them. You're indebted to them. And because you are indebted to them, because of unforgiveness, you open the door to the enemy. And you will constantly pay that debt in another way until you forgive. Amen. You will constantly pay it another way. And the enemy will decide how you pay it. Remember Jesus gave a parable. Now he used money to, to describe a spiritual meaning in the same way that he did in his prayer. In the parable, remember the man that owed his master so many millions of dollars. Right? And the master called, caused him and everything he had to be sold. And so the servant came down and bowed down before the master and cried out to him and said, give me time. I will repay you. So what did the master do? He forgave him the whole debt. He didn't give him time to repay. He just forgave him the whole debt, right? This servant went out and found one of his servants that hold him a few bucks. We talking about millions of dollars versus a few bucks. And his servant did the same thing that that servant did to his master. Give me time and I will pay you all. What did that servant do to his servant? He had him thrown in jail. Had him thrown in jail. Well, first of all, he ain't going to pay it while he's in jail, first of all. Right? So, other servants heard what this servant had did to his servant. Y'all with me? And so, the master called his servant back to him. Said to him, Because I forgave you, all of that debt shouldn't you have forgiven that debt good question right now watch this he didn't give him a chance at that moment to forgive he had to learn a lesson why because he knew better he knew better did you notice that? He could have said, oh, I forgive him. I forgive him right now. And let him off the hook, right? No, he didn't do that. He cast him into prison. He cast him into prison. Now watch this. And the scripture says, until he paid all the debt. Because he did not forgive, then what he was forgiven of, he had to pay it all now back. Now, don't think of money, all right? 
when you don't forgive something comes into your life that is destructive it does the debt that you need to pay by forgiving that person a lot of times unbeknown unbeknown because sometimes that person don't even know that you have something against them and they may that person now They have, a, they have a debt, you have a debt against them, and they are your debtor now. They, have, they hold you in prison. You let them hold you in prison because you won't forgive. Now, the servant was forgiven everything, but because he didn't forgive, everything now that he owed is back up on him. Now, he won't come out of prison until he pays it all. What is it saying? When you, and we all miss it, right? We all miss it. We all need to repent of things, right? Well, when you don't forgive, some things that you've repented of and bypassed because you repented of it, now the enemy is allowed to bring it back, back into your life. And not just a little bit of it, but now you will feel the full effects of your disobedience. You will feel the full effects of it. It will run its entire course in your life. Amen. Some things, again, some things, when you for repent, you stop it right then and there, right? You stop the hand of the enemy when you repent. Well, in this case, the Lord is saying that when you refuse to forgive, you don't stop the hand of the enemy. Now you will feel the full impact of what the enemy will bring against your life. That's what he means, he says, until you pay it all. So the moral of the story is, brother, sister, what? Walk in repentance. Walk in forgiveness. Be quick to forgive. Not only that, not only that, you cannot, and here's the biggest picture, you cannot enter into thanksgiving and worship with unforgiveness in your life. You can't. You can't. What does Mark 11, 25 say? Jesus said, when you stand praying, what? Forgive. If you have ought or a debt against someone. Didn't he say that? Then he also says in another place, if you remember that you have something against your brother, what did he say? Lay your, lay your, lay your sacrifice down. Go get it right, and then bring your sacrifice, right? Well, sacrifice is also worship. If you have unforgiveness on the inside of you, and you try to press into the spirit realm with thanksgiving, you press into the wrong side. The Lord is not giving you thanksgiving and worship. The devil is. And you is energizing him. Amen. Light and praise is not coming out of you. Darkness is. Dark light is. And you're energizing the enemy. And you're causing yourself to be bound more and more and more. That's why we as believers, as Christians, you have to. If the only, and you heard me say this, the only hindrance to the faith that the Lord ever mentions is unbelief or unforgiveness. That's the only hindrance he ever mentioned to faith. So that means you as a believer, the biggest struggle you're going to have with, 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 with people is forgiveness. So,
So this tells us then that a renewal of your confession and repentance of sin needs to take place before you can experience true worship. Psalms 51. Psalms 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. See, this is what takes place literally. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. For I acknowledge my transgression. I acknowledge it. And my sin is ever before me. See, you, when you acknowledge your transgression, your death, or whatever it is, it's not when God saw you. God saw you when you did it. When you acknowledge it is when you get rid of it. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this guilt in thy sight. And so when it comes to unforgiveness or whatever sin it is, this is the way you have to see it. This is not something that you're doing against a person, though you are. It is not something that you're doing against yourself, though you are. Because the Bible said, you know, when it comes to sexual sins, you sin against your own body. So it's not that just you're doing against yourself, though you are. Well, remember what Joseph said to his to his. Uh, uh, boss's wife he said I can't when she he tried she tried to get him to lay with her he said I can't sin against God that's the way you have to see sin see because if you see it as sin against people then you can determine based upon your day how you feel about people or how you feel about the person you're sinning against right if you don't care about them that day, guess what? It ain't gonna matter to you if you sin against them. In your mind, the enemy will tell you they deserve it. <laughs> you reason it out. But if you put it in proper perspective where it belongs, you're sinning against God. Then that gives you uh, that gives you pause, doesn't it? I'm doing it against my king the one I say I love right what did Jesus say to the ones that read it to stone even though it was the law the woman caught in adultery though they didn't bring the man out there because they were supposed to bring them both but notice they brought the woman but they left the man typical right Jesus walks up to right on the ground and says what? Who of you that is without sin throw the first stone? <laughs> Amen. That same question he puts to all of us all the time. That's why he told you if your brother sinned against you and one day 490 times. The number is limitless. The point is there is no number you can place upon it. That was the point he was trying to make. Right? Right? See? So, what, 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 is, what, is, the, what is the dynamic that is going on here? Forget, again, I want to keep emphasizing this. Forget about, and this is the, that's why we chose the Lord's Prayer to show you the importance of praise and thanksgiving. The, you, you, you hinder needs being, get, you hinder getting your needs met in any area of your life. 
any area of your life. If there is a not, if there is not a strong, strong um, attitude of thanksgiving in your life, I was going to say prayer life, but when you when most people hear the word prayer they hear asking God something. But thanksgiving is prayer. Matter of fact, praise and thanksgiving is the highest type of prayer. Because it's going before God and not asking Him for anything. And if you learn how to give thanks, really give thanks from your heart, you won't have to ask God for anything. He'll give it to you without you asking. Right? The scriptures say he know what you have need of before you ask. Seek ye first the kingdom, and everything will be added. Amen. Because the more you give thanks, the more you begin to understand that a lot of things that you ask for is really not even needed. becomes unimportant to you. Amen. Becomes unimportant to you. So, so in the, in the, in, in, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but if you go on and read all of Psalms 51, the first 17 verses are about confession and repentance. The first 17 verses. The last two verses is about worship or temple worship. Amen. So, we should put more emphasis on what? Repentance. <laughs> and confession. So, now let's look at another aspect of worship real quick. Hebrews 13, 15. Hebrews 13 and 15. An aspect of worship, which most don't really understand. And this is the whole point. This is the whole point of the message. It's just not just telling God how great and wonderful he is. Because God knows that. There is a contractual thing that you enter into when you give thanks to God. It is much more beneficial to you than to him. Hebrews 13 and 15 says, By him, by him, by the Lord, by Holy Spirit, by Holy Spirit, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. This is, let me tell you what it is, the fruit of our lips and then he tells you what should come out of your lips giving thanks to his name. Amen. Amen. So this tells us that a born-again Christian, when we are cleansed and sanctified, we should constantly utter words of appreciation to Christ for being the one true sacrifice. So the word give thanks is an expression of worship, which should be directed toward God. Right? And he said continuously. So that means, amen, and, and I know you do, throughout the day, throughout your day, Amen. You're saying, praise God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That's giving thanks. You know, someone said something to you, praise the Lord. That's giving thanks. You know, I remember hearing a preacher say, give it a testimony. He said, um, he was what a friend of his. And he hadn't seen him a while. But he, the preacher, he had got saved. And... So he said he was with his friend, 
And every now and then, he would say, praise God. And he would say something, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He says, what are you doing? He said, what do you mean? He said this, praise God. Every, every, all the words, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. He said, that'll happen with you. He said, if it was a habit, it, wasn't, it was a habit I never had before. <laughs> See what I'm what I'm talking what I'm talking to what I'm talking about. When there is an attitude of thanksgiving with you all the time, brother says it'll come out of your mouth. It is something that your spirit will spontaneously bring to your lips. I mean, you know, whether you were a sinner or a Christian, it will be automatic. Why? Because it is the it's it's. Remember the scripture said to, to you that with joy we draw waters out of the well of salvation? Well, what I'm saying to you, brother and sister, if you maintain the right attitude, your spirit man will automatically do it, unconscious to you. Even in a thanks, praise God, hallelujah, glory to God. Not when you're just doing something religious. You know, or looking at a religious movie or reading the Bible or not when, when you just purposely alone and you went there to worship in your everyday life. Your spirit will lead, will cause a spontaneous flow of giving thanks. What are you doing? You're drawing water out of the well. You're drawing water out of the well. What are you doing? You're drinking. You're drinking. The Bible said, be not drunk with wine and with excess, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to yourself. It praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's not speaking to yourself. What is? Speaking to yourself. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing and making a melody into your heart. This is my point, brothers and sisters. This is why some of you are so dried up. This is why some of you, you know, is uh, acting like a prune all the time, you know, all stuck up, all weary, all down in the mouth, amen, because you're not constantly drinking and washing yourself like you're supposed to. Praise, listen, if, if some of you make a round trip to heaven, one thing that you're going to notice above everything else in heaven, beyond all the beauty, is the constant praise and thanksgiving that goes on out of the saints of the mouth out of the mouth of the saints glory to God hallelujah praise the Lord I mean you can be in heaven somebody said praise the Lord it's a chain reaction praise the Lord praise the Lord praise the Lord praise the Lord it's a chain reaction why because it is a place of joy and thanksgiving well, you have heaven on the inside of you. I'm telling you, it's part of the washing that takes you, 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 you will free yourself of more trouble and difficulty from your life, amen, with an attitude of praise and thanksgiving. Amen? Look at, um, look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 2. What happens when you allow sin to continue and you still try to worship? You know, somebody has done something to you. You're all upset, mad, and angry. Don't want to let it go because it feels good. Your flesh Second Timothy 2 and verse 17. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Phidias. That's reading from the Amplified. And their teaching will devour it, will eat its way like cancer, or spread like 
gain green. Now, 1 Timothy 1.20. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 20. Of whom Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, I guarantee you these two men, I guarantee you these two men, because Paul mentioned them twice in writing to Timothy, that they were still doing their Christian thing. But Paul had turned them over to Satan. Amen. And we see in 2 Timothy that they were what? They were still teaching. But they were, their words had become poison. Huh? So what was Paul doing? Turning, over, turning them over to the enemy because of the false doctrine that was in their heart. That trouble would come into their life and drive them back to God before, their die, before they die. That's what he was doing when he was turning them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. The same thing he did to in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 when that young man took his daddy's wife. Same thing. Paul turned him over to Satan and then when we see in 2 Corinthians that what? When the devil got a hold of him, he came back to the Lord and repented. Oh yeah. Amen. Uh, 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 another spiritual tool in God's awesome. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> you don't think God still does that? Yes, he does. So what am I saying? When a person has a sinful heart or a heart not totally committed to the Christian life, that person, fruit of worship, is not true worship. One of the responsibilities, brothers and sisters, that we have as Christians is to live a godly life. There should be an attempt on your part to do what? Live right. True worship is seeing Christ with your spirit eyes when you tell him how much you love him. That's what true worship is. When you're worshiping God, you're saying to him, I love you. You're saying to him, I need you. That's what, you, that's what true worship is. You are chowing him with thanksgiving. You're saying to him, I love you. Well, Jesus says, if you love me, do what I say. But if you're not obeying him, if you're not uh, 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 living a godly life, when you come into the house of God or you by yourself, think you're not worshiping. Because worship is saying to him, I love you. Amen? If you're not obeying him, you don't love him. So, when you see with your spirit eyes, you know the Holy Spirit has placed a thought in your mind, it reveals knowledge. And I'm not talking about visions or dreams or hear him speak an audible voice. A lot of you see spiritually and don't even recognize it. Let me show another way that you see spiritually. When your spirit eyes, your eyes of your spirit see something, And usually, it's doing worship when your spirit man is heightened, when you've been washed and washed and washed and washed. When your spirit eyes see something, then it impresses upon your thought, boom, at that moment, the very thing you see. How many of you have ever been in here worshiping, giving thanks? You didn't see with your physical eyes. Okay, you didn't see a vision of where the spirit realm opened up and you saw, but you really saw with your spirit. So there is there is there is different different levels of meaning when you say, "I saw with my spirit eyes." Okay, there's different levels of meaning. The Holy Spirit can drop the veil off of your eyes. And you can see angelic beings in the room. You can see them standing. But then there is another level of seeing where your spirit man will place a thought, impression on your mind so strong that you know immediately what 
your spirit man is seeing. That's another level of seeing. And so I see both ways. And sometimes when I'm telling you I'm seeing this, I'm seeing through that process that I just told you. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? You're looking at me real strange. Do you understand what I'm saying? Come on, say, tell me if you do. Shake your hand. Some of you are not shaking your hand, so you don't understand. Okay. You can see in vision form. Okay. Where this world disappears. This rim disappears. And you see into the rim of the spirit. That's vision form. You can see, amen, where you, this rim, you, I see all of y'all, but I see beings in the room too. That's seen, okay? You also can see, your, your spirit man right now is seen just like your physical eyes are seen, but you're not processing anything your spirit man is seeing. But then there is a time when your spirit man will place a thought on your mind so strong at that moment, if you know it, then you are seeing there. That's a level of seeing too. Yes, one is more by faith, but it's still a level of seeing. And if it gets something that you get used to, you will know when it's real or not. You don't have to think about it. See, so I know there are certain times you sitting here that has happened to you, but you thought it was just your imagination. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. Your imagination. Your spirit placed that thought which produced an imagination on, 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 your, on, your, on, on, on your mind. That's seeing, brother. So, so that's another level of seeing. And you need to develop that. You need to know that. Okay. Anyway. So when you think of true worship, does church play an important role in it today? The angels learned to worship long ago. We are and have learned through Old Testament temple worship. New Testament church worship and, and it should pattern heaven's worship why because it is preparing us to worship there the priority purpose for saints and angels is to worship the Lord amen just as the golden lamps represents the seven churches in the earth we should be a part of of some church and fellowshipping with other churches. John 4 and 24 tells us that. So another aspect of true worship is the time factor. When we worship, part of our worship has to do with time, and part doesn't, right? Because we live in both realms. True worship, the true worship we do in our spirit does not have a time factor. But the fruit of worship we do that includes our manifestation like what? Lifting our hands, kneeling down, right? Dancing. That has a time factor involved, okay? You can, you, well, you may say, why is that important? Why should I get involved with that aspect? Well, first of all, the Bible tells you. Doesn't the Bible say lift up, hold your hands in the sanctuary? Why would the Bible tell you to do something that's not important? Again, if you are flowing with Holy Spirit, if you're allowing yourself to be cleansed and purified, remember, your spirit will spontaneously cause you, lead you in that, in, that, in that arena, in that way. The Holy Spirit will quicken you as to how exactly the Lord wants you to express yourself. That's the way it is in heaven. The Holy Spirit directs everything in heaven. Everything. So you come to church, and the Lord might have designated, he wants you to express yourself in dance today. And if you express yourself in dance, then you would trigger something else that the Lord would bring to you from heaven. But guess what? 
What if that doesn't happen? What if you don't enter into that dance before the Lord? Well, the Lord will just give it to you anyway. No, he won't. Because God had determined something a particular way. It's being what? It's being led of the Spirit. So what am I saying to you? More importantly, the most important part of any service, brother and sister, is the worship and giving of thanks. You know what I'm saying to you? It's blessing the Lord. That is the most important part. Because God can download, for you even hear anything preach, God can download everything you need right then and there. It's according to the Holy Spirit. It's according to what he has designed for you that day. Amen. And being ignorant is no excuse. In worship and giving thanks, you cannot let yourself be, dis be distracted. Don't let yourself be divided. Amen. I mean, even if you, I tell you what, one, well, some of you do, 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 um, do yourself a, a, a big discredit. Because why? Some of you, when you're worshiping, your eyes are all open, you're looking around, you know, you're processing things in the natural. That's why some of you can't enter in. If it's, if it's difficult for you, then you need to learn how to enter in with your eyes shut first and establish that, then it's easy to do with your eyes open. That's why we're so easily distracted. Worship, giving of thanks, is intimacy with the Lord. Let's put it another way. It's intimacy with Him. When you get intimate with Him, He will give you what you need. He will give you the deepest part of Himself when you are intimate with Him. Amen? Okay. I'm not done, but I'm going to stop. Come on, stand to your feet. We'll pick it back up somewhere down the road. Father, we just thank you today. Your word has said it is more blessed to give. So right now, Lord, as we stand before you, we give ourselves to you. We give all that we are to you. We surrender all that we are to you, our precious King. Come on, just lift both hands and give thanks to the Lord. Thank you, Father, for this provision that you made, this interaction that you created for our purpose, that we can come into your presence with thanksgiving in our heart, that you would always extend your scepter to us to cause us to draw near to you, and you will pour out of everything that we need. We know not what to pray for as we are. We don't even know what we really need. But you do. And we thank you today, Daddy. We thank you today. Hallelujah. As we acknowledge our King and his faithfulness to us. Thank you, Lord, for revelation speaking to our hearts illumination, leading us and guiding us. Oh, hallelujah. And meeting every need that we have. Thank you, Dad. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, come on. Oh, hallelujah. I feel it. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you, Daddy. Hallelujah. We receive now from you, Lord. You know what the week has lied before us. We thank you we pull from that realm into this one. Glory to God. We take by faith what is needed. Oh, hallelujah.
Thank you, Dad. Glory. Ooh, oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Dad. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. Hallelujah. And to sing praises unto his name. Oh, most high. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Glory, 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 glory. Bless be the Lord God, maker of heaven and earth. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Don't walk out of here without your mind being washed. Don't walk out of here without your thoughts being washed. Oh, hallelujah. Don't walk out of here without your eyes being made pure before the Lord. Thank you, Lord. He that knoweth to do good and doeth not, to him it is a sin. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Learn to allow him to reach out and, and, and pull from you that which is needed. Learn to give him what is pausing us at that time, what we have our eyes upon that is not good. Turn your eyes toward him, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The admonition is to not act like a child. Put away childish things. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Oh, hallelujah. This is the walk of faith. This is the battle that we are called to. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. To overcome, yes, even overcoming the emotions that overwhelm us, even overcoming the emotions that imprison us, even overcoming the thoughts that bind us. This is the life of overcoming. Take from the arsenal of your spirit man and empower yourself from the inside. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Oh, praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on. Open your mouth. Give thanks. The Holy Spirit is prompting me. Come on, open your mouth and give thanks. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We appreciate you. Hallelujah. We appreciate you, Father. Glory to God. We thank you for your grace, how you put up with us. Hallelujah. But your spirit will not always strive with man. Your spirit will always put up with man. Oh, hallelujah. You're admonishing us to go on to perfection. Hallelujah. Lay hold of eternal life. Press toward for the prize of the high calling. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Glory, glory glory unto you almighty king glory glory unto you almighty lord thank you jesus thank you lord jesus thank you lord jesus thank you lord jesus glory to god glory to god hallelujah glory to god Glory, 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 glory. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Ooh. So, ooh, glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Pulling down strongholds. Hallelujah. We pull them down. The power of thanksgiving and praise. Hallelujah. Pulling down. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you, Daddy. Sakuraba shekerebokorama. Mumbri makash no kreki. Zero mumbri mdiri burma de Krishna rabata. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> we change the channel in the spirit. Hallelujah. The channel of our imagination. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Bless your people today, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. As you surround them with love. Your banner over us and around us is love. Thank you, Lord. We wear it as a garment. Oh, hallelujah. Today. We were love as a garment today. We throw aside the spirit of heaviness. We put on, hallelujah, the garment of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. It is a garment. It is a garment that you wear. Oh, hallelujah. It is the garment of praise that makes the enemy's weapons not formed against you. Prosper. They will form, but they will not prosper as you wear the garment of praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, if you have anything to give, praise God. Just give it in your hand. Amen. Praise God. Turn around and greet someone before you.